Okay, let's get started. My name is Ian Clark. I'm the architect of Locutus, which is a new platform for building decentralized applications on the internet. Really, our goal is to create a whole new decentralized ecosystem that puts you, the individual, in charge of your online presence rather than a handful of big tech companies. For more background, you can visit freenet.org or you can watch my previous talk, which I'll link in the description. This is specifically focused on the question of decentralized reputation and trust. What do we mean when we talk about a reputation? I think most people intuitively understand the word, but it can be helpful to spell it out when you're building a system around it. Your reputation is information about you that will predict your future behavior. This could be anything from your likelihood to send me a spam email that I don't want, or if I purchase something from you, the likelihood that you'll send it to me and the likelihood that I'll get it quickly and it'll be of high quality. Your reputation is also an asset that is at risk if you perform poorly or if you cheat somebody or do anything else that might damage your reputation. So the better a reputation that somebody has, the greater their incentive to protect that reputation in the future. That adds to the safety and trust of dealing with somebody that has a good reputation. What can we use a reputation system for? Well, there are many uses. So spam prevention is one example. When you give somebody your email address, let's say, you're essentially giving them permission to add things to your email inbox. You're, you're giving them a key to your attention and you're trusting that they won't abuse it. Now, there are various tools for detecting spam after the fact, but Obviously, a better solution is if there's some consequence to abusing your trust, and a reputation system can provide that. Email is not the only example of that. If you're participating in a discussion forum or a group chat or anything like that, you have the ability to distract other people. Other people are essentially trusting you not to waste their attention and a reputation system can ensure that they don't. Reputation systems can also establish trust prior to a transaction. So we see this with eBay and Amazon, where you're about to engage in a transaction with somebody, maybe you're gonna send them some money, and you need to trust that they are gonna follow through on their side of the bargain, and a reputation system can ensure that they do and punish them if they don't. Reputation systems are foundational to a lot of what we do on the internet. How does a reputation system work in Locutus in a decentralized way? Well, a quick refresher. So one of the fundamental concepts in Locutus is that you have a contract and you have that contract state. And a contract is a piece of software that determines what state is permissible for that contract. The state is just data. It's just an array of bytes. It could be anything from a document to some HTML to a piece of a video or a piece of audio. It can be anything. And the contract's job is to decide what state is permissible for this contract. Can the state be modified by the contract owner? And also, how can that state be synchronized efficiently across a large number of peers? I'm not going to get into the decentralized mechanism so much here, but these contracts and state exist in this decentralized Locutus cloud. They don't reside on any one computer. No one person, computer organization controls them, and they're all med mediated through cryptography. And also any peer in the Locutus network can verify that the state is valid for that contract. It, using a database analogy, you might think of the state as a database table and the contract is like the access control list for that database table, which controls who can access it and who can modify it, delete it, 
add information to it. In the Locutus reputation system, we use a contract to manage somebody's reputation log. This is a record of past interactions with the owner of the reputation log, be they positive or negative. And, but the important thing is that it's a public record of your interactions with other people that other people can see. Think of it like in eBay, you can look at somebody and you can see the feedback that, that they've received from people that they've transacted with. It's the same idea, except it's decentralized. It's all enforced through cryptography. Nobody controls your reputation. The three key pieces of information in a reputation log are what was the transaction? What was the nature of the transaction? Who was on the other side of the transaction? Who is the counterparty? And what was the outcome? Was the counterparty happy or unhappy with that transaction? How does this feedback mechanism occur in practice? Well, to begin with, let's say you have Alice and Bob, and this is a bi-directional transaction. So in this case, they each want to be able to provide feedback to the other. So the first thing they each do is create a auth token. And this is a cryptographic token that in Alice's case will give Bob the ability to add reputational feedback to Alice's reputation log and vice versa as well. They, they exchange these tokens. So each of them can now add feedback to the other's log. They then have their trusted transaction, whatever it might be, perhaps Alice sells a widget to Bob. And afterwards, each of them then uses the feedback auth token to record on the other person's reputation log how that transaction went. There is one risk here, which is what happens if Alice gives Bob her reputation auth token, but Bob just doesn't reciprocate. And then let's say Bob is evil and he leaves some negative feedback for Alice. Now Alice has got screwed in this interaction. We can address this type of problem by having a two step trust handshake where the first trusted interaction is the exchange of tokens itself. It's like initially they're agreeing to exchange tokens, but they do a token exchange in order to ensure that they both do that. And that way, if one of them doesn't follow through on exchanging tokens, the other can leave them some negative feedback, which others will see, and that might warn them off interacting with that person in future. So that's just one of many examples of, of how flexible this approach is. So the next important question with reputations is that if reputations are free to create, then a new reputation is worth nothing to the reputation owner. And therefore it conveys no trust to anyone else in the network. If you're new to the system and you haven't got any feedback, there's this question of how do you bootstrap your reputation so that other people can have some reason to trust you. Otherwise you can just abuse them with, with absolutely no negative consequences whatsoever, because if you get some negative feedback, you can just create a new reputation. The way we address this in Locutus is a trust source. This is somebody who is fairly widely trusted, such as the Freenet nonprofit itself, where they can give you some initial trust. Why would they do that? Well, one example might be that you make a donation to the Freenet project, and then the Freenet project will record some trust on your reputation log that says this person made a $10 donation, for example. Why does that make you trustworthy? Well, now it means that if you ruin this reputation by getting negative feedback, you've essentially lost the benefit of your $10 donation. So in effect, you've invested $10 in this reputation and other people can take that as a degree of trust. Now, of course, if you're just investing $10 in a reputation and then you're conducting a $10,000 transaction, 
that may not be worth very much. So the size of the donation can vary and other participants can decide how meaningful the donation is based upon the nature of the transaction. If all you're doing is you want to be trusted to not spam somebody, then even a one or two dollar donation might be sufficient for that. So maybe you don't want the Freenet project to be able to tie your reputation to your payment information for reasons of privacy. So what do you do? There's something called a blind signature in cryptography. And the notion is that I can take my public private key pair. You can say, Hey, I want to make a donation and get some initial reputation bootstrap from you. And then you can take your reputation log, the public private key pair that represents your location log. You can encrypt your, pro your public key, send it to me. And I can use this blind signature algorithm to sign your encrypted public key. I never get to see your public key, but then I send the signature back to you and you're able to decrypt. And then what you're left with is your public key has been signed by Freenet, but we have no way to tie who you are as an individual to that specific donation. So this is a way that we can maintain privacy with this system. Another benefit, of course, is that it provides a funding mechanism for Locutus development. One of the problems with building a completely decentralized system is that it doesn't lend itself to a lot of the normal business models that people use because being decentralized, there isn't anywhere to put a toll booth. And I think this of all of the potential funding mechanisms, I think this is one of the most interesting because anyone can create their own trust source. It doesn't have to be Freenet. Now, of course, if a random person creates a trust source, nobody's going to trust it. But the idea is that over time, participants in the network can learn which trust sources are effective at predicting who is going to be trustworthy in the future. If I have a trust source that says, oh, this person donated $10,000, but then everything after that is just negative feedback then people are going to correctly conclude that this trust source really isn't a very reliable predictor of future behavior. The question then is, well, how do we assess the effectiveness of the trust sources? Now, I spoke about it briefly, which is that we look at which reputations the trust sources endorsed, and then we look at the future behavior. But with the trust source, there's also the size of the donation. It would be quite limiting if there was only one type of trust. If trust was a binary thing, you either had it or you didn't. It's, mu it's much more powerful if you have the ability to have a scalar degree of trust. That's what we're doing with donations, where the larger the donation, the more trust that that should elicit. But what's that relationship? And there's a neat algorithm that I've used in a number of diverse contexts that's very good at solving exactly this problem. It's called an isotonic regression. Let's say we collect a bunch of data points where we have the trust source metric, and then we have information about future behavior in terms of trustworthiness. And then we give it a bunch of data points and the isotonic regression is able to figure out what that relationship is based only on the assumption that the higher the metric is, so the, the higher the donation, the more trustworthy somebody should be. Or at the very least, they shouldn't be less trustworthy if they've donated more. You could see this as a simple machine learning algorithm where the system will adaptively learn who is trustworthy over time. And that way, if there are sources of trust that are better, or more reliable or more accessible, lower barrier to entry than the initial trust source that we're providing, then people can naturally migrate to that. So it reduces the concern over centralization. Alternate approaches to doing this that would be decentralized might involve proof of work, for example. So maybe you could prove that in order to initialize a reputation that you had spent a hundred dollars on 
processing power and that would work and it would be decentralized but then we fall into burning energy for no good reason which is bad for the environment a solution that achieves the same goal while also providing a funding mechanism for Locutus and Freenet seems like better all around, even if we are compromising a little bit on centralization. But again, nobody's going to be forced to use this system. And in fact, other people might be able to create different parallel reputation systems on top of Locutus. Our goal is just to provide some good defaults that hopefully will be good enough that people use. When people think of reputation systems, they probably don't think so much of discovery and search. But of course, discovery is fundamental in any system. Google is the world's most popular website and it's key to how most people use the internet. So you need a way to discover things in any system. But the problem with discovery is how do you know what to prioritize? Let's say it's a keyword search based discovery. How do you rank the search results? Now the solution that Google used is was originally PageRank. So you look at how many other websites are linking to a website and on the assumption that that's a good indicator of quality. But I've certainly noticed, I think, a decrease in quality of Google search results over the years. And I think the problem is that while Google has been getting better at trying to trying to figure out the quality, objectively figure out the quality of search results, the problem is that search engine optimization experts have got better, faster at manipulating that mechanism. One of the, I think, interesting things about a reputation system is that a good reputation system is going to be a much more accurate and much more difficult to manipulate signal of quality that can then be used to build a decentralized keyword search engine that will allow people to discover new things on Locutus and get what they're looking for so I'll go into more detail about the mechanics of, of how that might work. This notion of a much more powerful quality signal than most of what's available on the internet today is extremely powerful. And it's potentially a way that even aside from decentralization and, and all of that, that Locutus could actually provide something that's better than what people have now to better user experience. So how might we implement something like that? Well, the basis of any search engine is a data structure called an inverted index. Imagine you have a bunch of, let's say we might call them documents. They might be web pages. They might be Locutus apps, or they could be anything, but I'll call them documents because that's what they're called in the context of an inverted index. So what happens is you have all of these documents and you go through them and identify keywords. These are words that uniquely or at least somewhat uniquely identify that document. And there are pretty sophisticated algorithms for identifying those words. One of the simplest is called TFIDF. And the, the idea with TFIDF is that it knows statistically how likely any given word is to appear in normal usage. And it'll look at a document and it'll identify words that appear disproportionately relative to common usage. Because if you don't do it that way, then you're going to identify keywords like and and but and or, which are so common that they're essentially useless for the purpose of searching. And by the way, you don't necessarily have to identify those keywords automatically. In many cases, the document author might provide those keywords. But once you've identified the keywords, you create the inverted index where for each keyword, you maintain a list of the documents that contain that keyword, or at least for which that keyword is important. And each of these keywords in Locutus would be a contract. So it would be a contract that's parameterized by the keyword where the contract state is a list of the documents and that list is in descending order of reputation as determined by the reputation system. Now, if you want to do a keyword search, you would type a couple of keywords 
and then the search app, which would be a Locutus app that's running in your web browser, starting with the rarest of those keywords, would go and download the state that corresponds to that keyword, which would be a list of documents. It would do this for multiple keywords. It would then identify the documents that overlap between those lists and using a merging algorithm, it will present the documents in descending order of importance. Pretty much a user experience, very, very similar to Google search, but hopefully with a much more reliable quality signal. This is an example of a sophisticated multiple contract system implemented in Locutus. One of the things that we're currently working on is a mechanism that will allow contracts in Locutus to interact. So Locutus as it is right now, contract has a state. The state can be updated in response to messages received by peers in the network, all mediated by the contract. But there's also the possibility that a contract could aggregate state from multiple other contracts. In the database world, this might be called a database view. The, the idea is that you could aggregate information from a bunch of other contracts. In the case of an inverted index, these keyword inverted indices would be created by aggregating information from many other contracts. And of course, then once you're doing that, you can get it very sophisticated. So you can have contracts that are aggregating information in other contracts and they in turn might be aggregated by other contracts. So what you're creating is what's called a data flow programming language, which is an idea that people experimented with in the 1990s. You could view a, a spreadsheet as a, as a primitive data flow programming language, but, but it's where your software is a graph where the nodes in the graph are processing information and data flows through this graph of nodes, eventually making it to the other side. This ability for contracts to interact and for contracts to aggregate information in other contracts is incredibly powerful, but it does raise some complicated questions like how do we ensure that the peers that are aggregating contracts are doing so accurately because obviously there's a degree of trust there so it will require validation mechanisms where other peers are essentially verifying that peers are aggregating correctly and what happens if they don't well one thing that would be useful there is a reputation system the beauty of a reputation system is that there are all kinds of ways that it can be used including as a component of other Locutus processes, such as this contract interaction mechanism. So that's pretty much it. This is thanks so much for watching. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit freenet.org on the web or follow freenet.org on Twitter. You can also subscribe to this YouTube channel. I plan on posting videos like this on a regular basis.